I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. This reading is for the book Haunted Valley, written by William Jevning and published in 2018. Southwest Washington State, more specifically the region where Skamania County is located, has had a long and dark history unknown to most people. From the earliest times, native people of the region spoke of beings that were said to inhabit the Mount St. Helens region, which ate men, and the indigenous peoples could not be enticed to venture there. One valley in particular that would have been idyllic for a place to erect a village was called Yakult, meaning Haunted Valley, by a native people, which was feared and known to be a dwelling place of the cannibal giants. Of course, as new American settlers and fortune seekers moved west, they did not listen to native warnings of such places and built homes and farms where they pleased. Over the many decades since the Yakult Valley was first settled, those who lived in this valley found out that they were not the only inhabitants, but kept quiet about what they knew was roaming the forests. No one would believe the stories. They just watched and hoped the forest dwellers would keep to themselves. Once in a while, though, farm animals would disappear, or deer hanging to cure would vanish during the night. But the people knew what happened to them. The taking of animals seemed like a fair price to pay for the other inhabitants to keep their distance. Most families in the valley quietly accepted this unspoken arrangement, but new residents were unaware of such knowledge and would not know its rules. One new arrival was the Goldammer family, and their ordeal began in June 1989. One morning that June, I went out in the front of the house where I lived to get the newspaper and sat down on the front steps to read it. The morning was sunny and beautiful, and everything was in full bloom, just a gorgeous late spring morning. I had not unfolded the newspaper and was looking at the headlines, and then I turned the paper over and got a big surprise. Three days before, on Sunday, the Goldammer family in the small community of Yakult, Washington, saw something they could have never dreamed of. Newspaper clipping from The Columbian, byline by Bob Bisson. Headline, Yakult family tells tale of Bigfoot. Brenda Goldammer and her teenage stepson say they never believed in Bigfoot until Sunday night when they saw what they described as a huge, hairy creature with a high-pitched scream and a face like a gorilla in the woods behind their house. Honest, they say. But as is typical in reported Bigfoot sightings, there is no solid physical evidence left for those who weren't there to consider. No clear footprints, no droppings, and certainly no photographs or body parts. Bigfoot, or Sasquatch as the Indians call the alleged ape-like monster, is one of the Northwest's most famous legends. More than 750 purported sightings of the creature have been reported over the last century. Brenda, 36, and her stepson Nicholas Goldammer, 16, said they were inside the house about one-half mile south of Yakult, about 9.30 p.m. Sunday, when they said they heard a screech outside. Brenda's two dogs were barking, she said, and her horse was bucking, and the chickens were going crazy in the chicken house, she said. She said that when she went out to investigate, her German shepherd, Rusty, ran into the woods behind the house. Then he came flying back here, yipping like somebody hit him, and ran under the porch. I looked out there, and there was this thing, this big, hairy, gorilla-faced thing. Nick ran after it, she said spotting it behind a tree, and then watching it run across a creek and into some brush on a knoll about 50 feet away. It stopped and it turned around and looked at me, Nick said. I stood there rubbing my eyes, not believing what I was seeing. It looked straight at us, she said. That's when my heart dropped. That thing must have been six or seven feet tall and had to have weighed 380 or 400 pounds. You couldn't see its mouth because everything was all hairy. 
I never saw it before in my life, and I know I never want to see it again, said Nick. Brenda called 911, and Clark County Sheriff's Deputy Richard Butler arrived about 40 minutes later. He reported he could find no physical evidence. As most newspaper articles about Sasquatch encounters normally are short on detail, and with the sighting being so recent, I immediately thought of going there to talk with the family. Fortunately, the author of the article had included the Gold Dammer address at the end of the article, so I went in the house and told my girlfriend Alice about the recent incident, and that I should drive to this family's home and talk to them about it. She agreed, and I took her 13-year-old son Joshua with me. I knew that since this article was on the front page of the Vancouver Columbia newspaper, that other people claiming to be Sasquatch investigators would have already gone to Yakult, but I wanted to talk with the family anyway. I took a binder that I often used when I spoke with witnesses that had a number of my own photographs of evidence and other information, so I had a quick reference when discussing the Sasquatch with people. The Goldammers lived on a small farm on the outskirts of a small town of Yakult, just a couple of miles from the Lewis River. Their farm reminded me a lot of the small farm I had grown up on and was situated in a very similarly rural area. We drove into the driveway, and young Nick Goldammer came out to see who I was. I introduced Joshua and myself to him, and he told me his name, although I recognized him from the photograph in the newspaper. I told him that I was a two-time witness of Sasquatches myself, and had seen the article that morning, and asked him if they would mind talking with me about their experience. He said he thought that would be all right, and asked me to come in and meet the rest of the family. His father, Nick Sr., was away for the day at work, but his father's girlfriend Brenda was there, and his younger sister, and two younger brothers. Brenda and Nick had both seen the creature, and were still very visibly shaken by the encounter. They told me that three other people had already been there to get their story and to look for footprints or feces or hair, but all had found nothing and left. I said that I thought this would be the case with the publicity of their account. All these persons had driven there from the Seattle area and had behaved in a very discouraged manner. I explained that this usually happens in these cases since many people want to become Sasquatch hunters but have little or no experience in the issue and when they don't find easy evidence, give up quickly. I told them about my personal experiences, and they told me that I was the only investigator they had spoken with that had also seen one of the same creatures they had seen, and said they felt more comfortable talking with me about what they saw. After we looked through the photographs and other materials I had brought, and explained that what they experienced was more common than they might have believed, I asked them if they would tell me what had happened, Nick and Brenda now seemed more relaxed and seemed ready to discuss the events of Sunday. Brenda began by telling me that they had been watching television that afternoon when she heard some commotion in the area of the corral where her horse was tied. She asked Nick if he would go out and check on the horse and make sure the rope was not getting tangled in its hooves. She had left the horse tied there to eat some radishes they had pulled from the garden and planned to put the horse back in the pasture afterward. Nick said sure and slipped on some shoes and went out to the corral. When he reached the fence, he said he saw what he thought was a man walking away from the corral along the tree line in the direction of the lower field. He wanted to find out who was trespassing on their property, so he crossed the fence and ran in the direction of the unknown person. When he reached about 50 feet of the person, he slipped and fell on a tree limb lying on the ground. The noise he made when he fell alerted the, quote, person to his presence, and the intruder turned around to see what the noise was caused by. Nick said when it turned around, he was in shock. It was no person, but a huge, man-like, hair-covered thing. Nick told me that he had recently moved to Yakult to live with his dad. He had lived the previous 16 years with his mother in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and had been a city kid. He had heard the word Bigfoot before, but never gave it any thought and moving to Yakult, he had heard of such things being reported in that part of the country, but did not believe he would see one, or even if they existed. He said the creature looked very surprised. He said it reared its head back, and its eyes were wide with the look of astonishment. Nick regained his feet, and then the creature leaned forward as if to get a better look at him. That's when the Sasquatch moved its arms out from its body in a 45-degree angle with its hands. Palms facing Nick began to come toward him. Nick had no idea what it meant to do, 
and ran as fast as he could back to the house. He quickly told Brenda what he saw while he slipped on a pair of boots that gave him better footing. He said that he grabbed his air rifle, although he later knew it would be of no use to something so large, but it made him feel better anyway having it. Nick then ran back out toward the corral to get a better look at the creature, which by this time had returned to its original course toward the lower pasture. Nick ran toward the creature, and when he got close, it once again turned to see what was coming toward it. Seeing Nick again, the creature charged at Nick, who quickly turned and ran for a small building next to their barn that housed grain for the horse. Nick quickly climbed on top of this small shed, and the Sasquatch ran to about 30 feet of the building and stood there for a while, as if to be certain Nick was not going to follow it again. Brenda was near the corral watching the whole time as the standoff continued. The creature seemed satisfied after a couple of minutes, and then it once more walked away in the same direction as before, toward the lower pasture. Nick said that he then climbed down from the top of the shed when the creature was out of sight, and he and Brenda went into the house talking about what they should do. They decided to call the sheriff's office to report what they saw. They said the dispatcher was less than friendly when they said what they wanted to report, but a deputy did come there and made a cursory look around, but found nothing. After the deputy left, they remained in shock, still barely believing what they had seen, but knew it was true. Sometime later, a reporter from the Vancouver Columbia newspaper, neither Nick nor Brenda knew how the newspaper found out about their account, but thought it must have been through the sheriff's department since they were still the only ones who knew what had happened. They agreed to an interview, and after the article had been published, began to have visitors claiming to be Sasquatch investigators from the Seattle area. Nick and Brenda both voiced concerns about people from the city knowing anything about something wild in their region but were polite and told their story each time someone new went there, and they showed them where the events took place. They said three groups of people went there. One even identified himself as a biologist, but none found any physical traces of the Sasquatch and left uninterested in further searching there. I asked if anyone questioned them about the Sasquatch going toward the lower pasture, and that it seemed intent on keeping Nick away from there and kept going in the same direction. Both he and Brenda indicated that no one previous to me had been interested in the slightest in the lower pastures, or the creature obviously not wanting Nick to go there. I asked if anyone had been in the lower pastures since the encounter. They said no one ever went there. It was an unused part of their land, and even their horse did not go there. I asked if it would be all right if I went there and looked around. They said it would be fine, and would show me the way. The pastures on the Goldammer land were uncultivated and covered in thick field grass of the kind usually cut to make hay. This grass was chest high, and there were many young sapling trees growing all through the pastures, mostly four to five feet in height. Today, all the sapling trees are more than 20 feet tall and have made a thick young forest on the pastures that were open in 1989. When we reached half the distance to the lower pastures, a small creek cuts through the land and we crossed this and continued into the far pasture area surrounded by thick forest. I saw a large cottonwood tree that had fallen over and walked over to look at it. Cottonwood trees have wide but very shallow root systems and commonly fall over during storms when they reach the large size this one had. At one place under this tree was a dried pool of water which looked as if it held two or more feet of water during the winter but was now dry. The place the pool covered was approximately 30 feet across, and the center was dirt with nothing growing on it. I went down to the dried pool that was mostly hidden by the tall field grass and the tree and saw that there were numerous footprints in the soil there. I found tracks of two young Sasquatches there. One track measured 9 inches long and the other 12 inches in length. It was now obvious why the Sasquatch had not wanted Nick to go in that direction. It was keeping him away from the two hidden young ones. Nick and Brenda were amazed at what I had found, and I told them Sasquatch behavior gets mostly ignored by all the so-called, quote, researchers, and end up as nothing more than interesting stories to them, which they tell other people to make them look like they know what they are talking about. I said I always follow up on behaviors because it leads me to more evidence from the initial encounters with people. From the description Nick and Brenda gave me of the Sasquatch, they both saw, 
I told them that one was a male, and from its description and behavior, it was very likely a young adult male. Now that we knew there were also two young Sasquatches, I said that there was a high probability there was also a female in the area, and may even be an older adult male, so they should keep their eyes open if the creatures came back. They were very impressed with my search methods and what I had learned from their encounters. They wanted me to head up any further investigation, and said they did not want anyone else on their land unless they specifically had my permission to do so. They told me they felt after dealing with a number of people investigating their Sasquatch encounter that none were as professional as I was or knew as much as me and gave me sole control over any further events that might happen. I thanked them for their compliments and trust but said that most often when people encounter a Sasquatch this way that it is a singular event and the creatures may be long gone now. They said they understood but still wanted me to handle any situation if something came around again. I agreed that I would, and told them I was the head of an organization called the Pacific Coast Sasquatch Investigation Team, and might bring some of its members to conduct a more thorough search of the area. This was welcome news to them, and they said that they were happy that someone who knew what they were doing took them seriously and was doing something about this. I thanked them again and said I would be coming back, and Joshua and I went home. This was a very interesting case, and geographically close to the part of Skamania County I had been working the past two years. The Goldammer encounters were just beginning, though, and would continue over the next nine months. 1989 was a year of change for me. The first change was that Alice and I would no longer be seeing each other less than a month after my initial contact with the Goldammer family. We remained friends, but went our separate ways, and she left the PCSIT soon after. The Pacific Coast Sasquatch Investigation Team, or PCSIT, was my original creation in 1975 after working with John Green and Rene DeHinden, the world's leading Sasquatch hunters when they were investigating the Puyallup Screamer incidents near Puyallup, Washington. My friends and I created the first incarnation of the organization after being asked by Green and DeHinden to assist them in searches for the creature in our home area. When I moved to Vancouver in the mid-1980s, I recreated the organization that was, at this time, a non-profit organization dedicated to collecting evidence to prove the existence of Sasquatch. We had now lost one of the senior members of the board of directors. Ron Madler incorporated the responsibilities of the office she held into his of the vice president. And later that summer, Candace Philpott also left the PCSIT. Candy enjoyed being involved with the group, but was getting married and moving to Portland, Oregon, and said she just wouldn't have any time to devote to the organization. We told her we were sad to see her leave, but wished her happiness in her new life. I went back to Yakult soon after my initial visit with the Goldammer family. This time I was able to meet Nick Sr., who still did not know what to make of what Brenda and Nick Jr. had seen. Nick did not really believe that Sasquatches existed, but did not discourage what young Nick or Brenda said they saw. I told him about the young one's tracks we found, and he told me it was all right for me to come and go as I pleased on his land. He wanted to know what was there, if this was real. That day I did something I never do, which was to search alone in a wooded area. Searching alone is never a good idea, and not only regarding the Sasquatch, but encounters with other wild animals and even falling and getting injured with no one to assist you. I knew with the short time since the initial encounter that tracks or even the creatures may be close by. I decided that I couldn't wait to arrange for other members of the PCSIT to come there and search with me. Another week may pass before this could be arranged, and I did not want to wait. I searched slowly with only my camera in hand for about two miles, and then finally came out near the main highway leading to the town of Yakult. The thought of encountering one or more of the creatures in the thick forest now weighed on me, and thinking how protective the creature Nick and Brenda saw of the two young ones was, I knew I was lucky they were not nearby. I decided to walk the road back to the Goldammer farm and not ever do something like this again. I called Ron Madler and told him about the Goldammer incident, and he said we should have a meeting with the other board members to decide how to handle this since it was so recent. 
I agreed, and he told me that he would arrange it. Two days later, we met at Ron's home, and I went over the events at Yakult, and Ron Madler wanted to take an active role in the investigation, as did Carol Simonis, who was the Director of Public Relations, and Don Turner, our Director of Photography. It was a great help to me having them with me during the events that lay ahead, the three of them being highly competent and observant. I told the three of them that we should go together to the Goldhammer home so I could introduce them to the family members and they would know it was all right if they came to look around because they were part of my organization. I called Carlo Sposito, a friend who had worked in field investigations with me for the previous two years, and told him what had happened at Yakult, but he was unable to go there because of other projects he had going, but was interested and wanted to be notified if we found any more evidence. I told him I would let him know if we found anything, but knew he would not be part of this investigation since he was heavily involved in his own investigations involving cattle mutilations and his personal business. The following weekend, the four of us went to the Goldammer home and met with the family. Carol especially was great in her position as Director of Public Relations and worked closely with the family members, while the rest of us conducted our searches in the area. During Carol's talks with the Goldammer family members, she uncovered some very interesting information from the youngest members. Brenda had two very small children, Nikki, who was two years old, and John, four. While casually talking with the two small children, young John pointed to one of the nearby pastures and said he saw, quote, the big monkey playing with his two boys, end quote. Carol was astonished and asked him again what he said, and his response was the same. Brenda, too, was astonished and had no idea the young boys had seen anything. Apparently, while playing in the yard, which was most days, the boys had seen one of the Sasquatches close by with the two young creatures. When we returned from looking over the land and deciding what search patterns we would use, Carol told us what she had discovered. Brenda was very concerned that something might happen to her young children and asked my advice. I told her that the Sasquatches had done nothing to anyone as of yet, but that they are wild creatures and to keep a close eye on her boys, just in case, to be safe. The family's German shepherd dog, Rusty, never strayed from the yard, and Brenda said she would pay close attention if the dog made any noises. I told her that was a good idea, since the dog would detect anything near the home before any of the family members would. I normally would drive to the Goldammer home in the evening and meet Don and Carol there, Ron worked as an electrician and his schedule varied, so he came when he was available. The Sasquatches seemed more active just before the hours of darkness, and often would begin screaming loudly from the direction of Yakult Mountain. I decided that I would go to the Goldammer farm very early some mornings also to see if they were as active during the pre-dawn hours as well. I then tried going there during various times of the day and night to try and determine if there were any patterns to the behavior we could document and follow, and eventually, a pattern did emerge. However, before we learned this pattern, a number of events happened that shook the Goldammer family far more than the initial sighting had. Approximately three weeks after the initial encounter, I received a call from young Nick, and he told me I needed to come there right away that the Sasquatch had returned and scared his sister badly. I told him I would be right there. The night before, everyone was away from home except Nick's younger sister, Tanya, and a friend of hers. Tanya was a year younger than Nick, and also had just arrived from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to live with her dad. Nick had told her what he and Brenda had seen, but that the creature had not returned. This night, around 10 o'clock, the two girls went out to see the horse in the barn, and were going to give it some oats when they heard something moving in the nearby field next to the corral. At first, they thought one of the neighbors was walking toward the barn, but when this visitor reached the light by the corral, they found out it was something quite different. The Sasquatch walked right toward the two frightened girls, who screamed and ran quickly to the house with the creature close behind. They pulled the outer screen door open so hard it detached from the upper hinge. The creature came right up and stared at the two of them through the large window by the living room, apparently fascinated by them. They did not know what to do and were becoming more frightened by the second. They then grabbed pots and pans from the kitchen and banging them together, making as much noise as they could and yelling, 
Go away. The creature, they said, finally got a bored look on its face and slowly walked back toward the corral and disappeared from sight. They locked all the doors of the house and closed the blinds and curtains and waited for Nick Sr. and Brenda to return home, scared for their lives. They said they did not call the sheriff's office saying, what would we report? When Nick Sr. and Brenda finally returned, the two girls were still in a state of panic and shock, and Brenda said it was hours before they could calm the girls and told them that they would have me come there and determine what the creature wanted. I told them that sometimes Sasquatches were just curious about people and that it had not harmed them, which apparently was not its intention. I explained that they move very quickly and if harming them had been what it wanted to do, it would have succeeded before they could have reached the house. I called Don, Carol, and Ron and told them what had happened and that this might be one of the rare instances where the creatures may stay in this place for an extended period of time and we might be able to film them if they kept coming to the house. We still did not know what attracted them to the Goldammer's home, but they did continue to return there. Typically, Sasquatches do not stay in any particular location more than about two weeks. However, there have been cases where they kept returning repeatedly to the same place for longer periods of time. No one knows why this happens, but we experienced this with the Puyallup Screamer incidents. At first I thought, since Yakult is not far geographically from the Washougal River, that there might be a food source that attracted the creatures near the Goldammer farm. I asked young Nick if there were any places where people dumped garbage in the area, but he knew of no such places. From the descriptions and tracks we found at Yakult, I knew this was a different group of Sasquatches than those that came to the Washougal River area, so maybe there was some other reason that this place held their interest. I thought about what Brenda had said about her putting radishes out for the horse, but that the horse didn't like them. She said each morning the pile of radishes was gone, and she thought some wild animals must have been eating them. The Goldammers were new at cultivating garden vegetables and did not eat radishes themselves. They grew prolifically, and that's why they tried giving them to the horse. I asked her if she minded continuing to place a pile in the same place each day. She said she did not mind since no one wanted them anyway. I told my three companions that maybe the radishes were why the creatures kept returning there. It was an easy meal, so why not? Also, there was no human activity in the fields south of the small town of Yakult. We questioned the owners of adjacent properties, and none of the people said they used or even went onto the property outside their yards. Older retired people owned many of the neighboring homes, so this was the reason for the lack of human presence in the area. The Sasquatches must have felt comfortable in the area and found treats, such as the radishes. Most of the time, Don and Carol met me at the Goldammer home. Often, we would meet and park our cars outside the driveway, as so not to disturb the family, and we could watch and listen better there. We attempted to be there to observe at least three or four times each week, and often experienced things happening. One evening, just after dark, I drove up seeing that Don and Carol were already there. We all got out of our cars to talk quietly, and Don told me that he had just seen one of the creatures cross the road, not far from where we were standing. He said they arrived about 20 minutes before I drove up, and not more than 10 minutes ago they were sitting there talking, and Carol was searching for some snacks they had brought when Don saw the creature clearly walk across the road directly to their front. It moved quickly across the road and was out of sight before Carol looked up. He said it was not yet completely dark, so he got a good look at it, and it was only about 50 feet from them. Don told me that Bigfoot was mostly Carol's interest, but since joining the PCSIT, he had become interested, but never thought he would actually see a Sasquatch. Now he had and his enthusiasm was much stronger for investigating. I said, Welcome to the club. I said that since this just happened, that we should remain quiet and watch, because it may come back. We waited for a couple of hours, but did not see or hear anything more that night. I am certain the creatures were well aware of our presence, and for all we knew, could have been very close by, watching the three of us standing there talking, in whispers, themselves wondering what we were doing, we looked for footprints the following day, but the thick field grass did not reveal any, although the grass was pushed down where the creature had walked. 
I began a habit of walking the small trail that led to the lower pastures where we found the footprints of the young Sasquatches. I walked this trail just after first light in the mornings. I had begun staying the whole night near the Goldammer home, watching and listening with my cameras and tape recorder close by. The summer of 1989 was a time of many strange events in the Yakult Valley. Years later, Ron Madler moved to Yakult and was elected as a member of the city council. He told me that Indians had named the place, and Yakult meant Haunted Valley. This name had been given this valley because of the creatures that frequented it, and Indians would not go there, which I related at the beginning of this story. Another evening at dusk, I again met Don and Carol near the place we now usually parked our cars. We were in the habit of bringing snacks and talking quietly while keeping our senses alert for any activity that may occur. This night, another car drove toward us from the direction of town. We always came in from the south of the valley, from the direction of the Lewis River. At first, we thought Ron Madler was joining us, but soon found out it was not Ron. The car was a blue Porsche, with two occupants. A man and a woman exited the car, which they parked close to ours, and said hello. I asked who they were, and the man said he was a biologist from Seattle, and that they were going up toward Yakult Mountain to spend the night and search for Sasquatches. I wondered to myself if this was one of the same persons that had talked to the Goldammers before I had the first time. I told them that I thought this was not a wise idea, since they might disturb the regular pattern of behavior the creatures had been exhibiting. They ignored us and donned backpacks and climbed over the barbed wire fence. We watched as their flashlights disappeared up the hill into the forest. I told Don and Carol I now knew why Rene de Hinden hated people with PhDs. They were arrogant and didn't listen to anyone. I told them then that those two would be back. I didn't know for certain that they would be back, but something told me that they would be. To my surprise, it happened much quicker than I thought. As the three of us stood there talking, still wondering just whom those two people were and what they thought they were going to accomplish, we heard noises coming from up the hill. Soon we saw flashlights, and then the two people running in our direction very quickly. As they got close to the barbed wire fence, they threw their packs over it. They were obviously terrified of something, and nearly injured themselves trying to cross the fence. This all happened very quickly as they got across the fence and grabbed the packs. They hurriedly got into the car, the man nearly driving off with the woman still hanging out of the car. They sped away fast, nearly losing control of the car. The three of us just stood there now in the silent darkness, at first not knowing what to say. They had said nothing to any of us and appeared just trying to escape some horrible fate. Then the three of us started laughing, the whole scene that played out before us looking almost cartoonish. Don said, well that will teach them not to listen, won't it? I told them that those two certainly were ill-prepared for what was coming down from the mountain and found out the hard way that they don't know everything. I have encountered this attitude so often during my four decades as a Sasquatch hunter. Everyone has their ideas and don't listen to someone with much more experience. One day, someone is going to find themselves in the wrong situation with these creatures and pay the ultimate price for ignorant thinking and behavior. We heard a wide variety of interesting things that summer. Sometimes the creatures would emit ear-shattering screams from just above the Goldammer Farm on Yakult Mountain. These screams would reverberate across the whole valley and set every dog and coyote yipping and barking in response within hearing range. Several times after dark, we heard what sounded like a group of horses running through the pastures, but there were no domestic animals of any kind kept in these pastures. After hearing this on more than one occasion, Brenda called me and said they found what might be places where Sasquatches had slept in the fields. We all went to look at this, and in the area where we had heard the running sounds, we found four or five large places where the field grass was flattened. I measured these circular flat places, and they generally measured six to eight feet across and eight to nine feet in length. They were not all the same. One flattened place was 15 feet across. But I said that maybe we heard the Sasquatches playing, and this is where they had lain down to rest. All speculation, but it fit the circumstances. I called Rene de Hinden and told him about the two people who had practically killed themselves getting out of the forest, and what we had heard, and the flattened places in the field grass. Rene laughed about the man and the woman, 
and said it served them right going into the bush half-cocked like that. He then told me regarding the flattened places in the field grass that he knew of this kind of thing in other places with sightings of Sasquatches and that I should look carefully at the grass in the flattened places as it would contain a lot of hair. I told him I would collect anything I found. He said good and to keep him posted. That August, I made one of my yearly trips to visit Rene at his home, and he took me to the shed where he kept his all-terrain vehicles and assorted equipment. He pointed to a number of large trash bags that were suspended from the ceiling and told me that they were full of the same kind of field grass I told him about. These were from a similar case like the one I was investigating at Yakult and were full of Sasquatch hair, but he had not yet time to go through the bags and do anything with the samples in them. Rene told me to always watch for such places, as it provided a good and ample source for Sasquatch hair. Rene never sat me down and gave any lessons about the Sasquatch. It was always in this manner, when I was heavily into an investigation and found something I was not familiar with. And then he would explain what I found, and what to look for in the future, and also how to handle both the situation and the evidence. De Hendon had chosen me to be his protege when I met him at the age of 17, he told me I was good, quote, in the bush, as he termed it, and wanted me to learn from him. I was still unable to convince René that he should come to Yakult himself and take over the investigation. He told me that I should continue there and was doing a good job so far. He said to keep in touch, and if the creatures continued coming close to the house, that he would try to come down. When I returned, I learned that another sighting had happened while I was away, one of Tanya's friends had been riding a bicycle on the road they lived on, but closer to town, and one of the creatures had crossed the road early one afternoon in front of her. Terrified, she called Tanya to tell her what she saw, and that she wasn't going anywhere near that place again. Ron Madler had done some research among local residents, and found that many people in and around Yakult had claimed to see such creatures. He got stories from all around the area, and this had been going on for years, the gold dammers, being new to the area, were the only ones who had reported the incident. Later that August, we were thinking of placing radishes in another part of the fields, and maybe a couple more items growing in the gold dammers' garden, to see if the Sasquatches would take these as well. Our thinking was that this new location could be monitored more easily, and cameras could be set up to capture the creatures on film. During this time, another PhD that wished to come there and look around having read the article about their experience, had contacted the Goldammer family. Brenda said that no one was allowed at their home without coordinating through me, and that they had given all discretion over their land to me alone. He agreed to this, and she gave me his number to call. I called him, and we had a nice conversation. I told him what my experience was, and that I was a close friend of Rene de Hinden, and of some of the things that had happened there. I told him we were thinking of placing some of the radishes in a different location to see if the creatures would take them from this spot also. I said we did not have night-capable cameras and hoped to capture the creatures on film either before dark in the evenings or early mornings. He told me not to be concerned that he had access to all the equipment we would need and offered his assistance for the chance to be involved. I said having a primate expert would be a big help to us and accepted what he offered. We arranged a specific day and time for him to meet me at the Galdammer home. We did have one disagreement before we hung up, and that was regarding placing all sorts of items where the creatures had been taking the radishes. I told him my early training in anthropology, stated that one should observe without altering the environment, and that we should not do anything to change the circumstances. He told me point blank that since he was a PhD, he knew far more than I did. I shot back that his Ph.D. didn't mean much when it came to Sasquatches, and my experience far outweighed his academic credentials. He smoothed it over by agreeing that we would discuss things and come to mutual agreements regarding how we would proceed. I was satisfied with this and told him I was looking forward to our meeting. Things did not work out the way it was supposed to have. I received a call from Brenda one evening about two days before I was supposed to meet this man, and she was extremely angry. The Goldamers were always informed of anything we did there. I liked the family a great deal and felt privileged they had placed so much trust in me and my staff and allowed us unrestricted access to their private property. They knew when I was supposed to meet this gentleman and that earlier that day they got a surprise visit from him. 
He had decided that making an agreement meant that he did not have to follow it and went there on his own with no one knowing. And Brenda and Nick Jr. related the following events to me. Brenda and Nick Jr. both told him that he was not supposed to be there without my presence and that I had been given control over anything that went on there. He ignored them. He had a couple of boxes, Brenda told me, with an assortment of vegetables, meat, and a box of donuts. He went out in the field closest to the house where we were placing the new radish location and put his, quote, Sasquatch treats alongside the radishes. For the past several nights, the creatures had begun taking the radishes from the new place, so we felt that we could continue getting them to come to this place. And over time, as they were more comfortable doing this, we would slowly bring in camera and sound recording equipment. I was unable, due to my new job, to be able to go to Yakult until the following day and learned even more. Apparently, this man had, in conjunction with going to the Gold Dammer home uninvited and specifically violating the agreement with me and knowing he was not welcome there without my being there, Brenda told me he was very rude toward her. This sort of thing really angered me and Don and Carol. Carol talked with Brenda, helping to calm her down, while Don and I discussed what happened. He said he now, too, could see Renee's point about some of these people with degrees. There was problems caused by the change in the different food items being introduced. It altered the pattern the Sasquatches had been using now for two months. They took the radishes as usual and the box of donuts, but apparently did not like anything else he put there. I found a large turnip, which is one of the items he mentioned on the phone when we talked that I said should not be put out there. One of the Sasquatches had taken a large bite out of the turnip and apparently disliked it and threw it down. Nick Jr. told me that he found out the neighboring farm then had been visited by the Sasquatches that same night and in apparent anger had totally destroyed their garden. He said it upset the people who lived there so much they moved away and sold the farm, never returning. We were unable to verify this, but when we went there, no one lived there any longer. I was hoping this stupid behavior by someone who should have known better had not ruined what was happening around the occult valley. I had seen other situations when Sasquatches were at a location and people doing seemingly innocuous things caused the creatures to become angry and throw things around as in a tantrum or to leave and never return. About a week later, we got our answer. The creatures were still coming to the Goldammer home. Nick Jr. called me one afternoon and told me that they had been hearing strange noises at night, and being hot that summer, they kept the upstairs windows open at night and could hear something walking through the yard at night. I told him we would come out and check it out. The four of us met that evening at the Goldammer home, and we all talked for some time in the house, then went outside. Don and Carol and I went around the side of the house with Nick Jr. and the dog Rusty, while Ron went with Brenda and Tanya the other side. We had a hard time seeing anything, as it was getting dark very fast. We noticed the dog acting strange, and he was moving as though hunting something, but never leaving the lawn. He was obviously hearing or smelling something close by in the pasture, which was now fully night, and none of us could see out there. We followed the dog along the fence line quietly until he got close to the road next to the yard. Then, suddenly, something big crashed through the bushes along the paved road, and we clearly heard the sound of bare skin slapping on the blacktop as one of the Sasquatches ran down the road away from where we stood in astonishment. I had never before heard anything like it, and clearly it was the sound of two bare, flat feet running down the road. We had been no more than approximately 30 feet from where the creature quietly walked from us toward the road, and none of us, except the Goldammer dog, knew it was even there until it exploded through the bushes, lining the road, and ran away from us. Another time, I took the son of friends with me to stay the night at the Goldammer farm. Ralph Garrish and I stayed up most of the night listening and then slept some. Just after first light the next morning, I took my usual walk through the pastures to where I had found the young Sasquatch footprints. On this morning, I found something unusual. The pastures were full of young trees of different kinds. All along the trail, all the trees had been simply pulled out of the ground and dropped by the trail. I found many dozens of these trees pulled up this way, and if anyone had ever tried to pull up a five-foot-tall fir tree, he knows it's no easy task. Fir and alder trees alike had been pulled out of the ground with no apparent reason. 
It appeared as if someone had simply walked along the trail and just plucked the trees out of the ground within reach as it casually walked along. Again, there were no people in this place, and the trees had no damage except that they had been pulled up. I believe the Sasquatches had done this. Why is anyone's guess. I had remarked in June to the Goldammers that the presence of two young Sasquatches meant that it was very likely that a female was nearby. We already knew of the male, that I felt was a young adult male, and the two young creatures, so the presence of a female was highly probable. One night I got a call from Nick Jr. He told me that I had to get there right away. He said, remember you said we might see a female creature here? I told him I did remember telling him and Brenda and his father this. He said they had heard what sounded like someone walking around the house that evening again, and when they looked out the kitchen window, there, right in the yard, Not 30 feet from the house, right under the yard light, was a female Sasquatch. I asked him how much earlier this happened, and he yelled, I'm looking at it right now. Right this second, it's standing right there watching the house. You gotta get here now. He said it was grayish colored, and he could see its breasts and everything clearly. I told him it would take me about 45 minutes due to the distance of where I lived in relation to Yakult. He said just get there as fast as I could. This was now approximately 11 p.m. and would be near midnight by the time I got there. He said he would keep watching it as long as it stayed there. I grabbed my camera and tape recorder and some plaster in case we found footprints and drove as fast as I could to Yakult. When I arrived, Nick came out immediately and said the creature walked away no more than a few minutes before I got there and must still be out in the field. I handed him a flashlight and took another one from my truck and we shined our lights toward the field. We soon saw the reflection of not one set of eyes, but two. The creatures were about 40 feet apart, but about the same distance from us, which was between 50 and 100 feet away. The flashlights were not bright enough to see more than the creatures' eyes shine, but we clearly watched them blink their eyes and turn their heads and walk around. The creature closest to the barn walked by the gate that led into the corral. This had two wooden posts on each side of the gate, with a two-by-four board nailed between the two posts. The top of this board I measured the following morning was eight feet above the ground, and the eye shine of the creature as it walked by the gate and turned its head in our direction was only a couple inches above this board, so we knew that one of the creatures was just over eight feet tall. We watched them for a few minutes. Both Nick and I tried getting photographs, but neither camera had a bright enough flash to reach that far from us. We did, however, get the eye shine on film. The creatures left not long after we each tried taking pictures. I think the flash bothered them, as the flashlights seemingly had not. I would always remember those eyes, a light amber color and large. I would see them again in the occult valley. When the creatures left, I looked around to see if the female had made any impressions in the yard. The ground was hard, and the lawn thick, and light impressions were there where the grass had been pushed down, but there were no markings that were worth photographing. Nick found one track in bark that was in a place that Brenda intended to make a flower bed. The impression was not well detailed, since it was in very loose tree bark, but it measured 16 inches long and approximately 6 inches wide through the forefoot. I photographed it knowing it was not very good, and even decided to make a plaster cast of it in case we were unable to see hidden details. I was there almost two hours, and finally put my equipment away and went home to sleep a few hours and come back to look around in the field where the creatures had been watching us from. When I came back later that next morning, Nick Jr. had not gone to sleep, thinking the creatures may return, but had not, as far as he was aware. We walked to where we thought the creatures had been walking around, but saw little more than where the field grass had been pushed down. I then decided to walk my usual route down through the fields to see if anything showed up there. I went a slightly different way than usual and began walking the same route the Sasquatch had the first time they saw it along the tree line. The trail wound its way along the edge of the forest and then over to the usual trail I walked in the mornings. Before this trail went away from the forest, I found a small area where tiger ferns grew. This area was about 60 feet across and was full of the miniature looking trees called tiger ferns. I soon noticed that a large area of these ferns had been pulled out of the ground and were lying in a bundle in the middle of the place they had been pulled from. I thought this was very unusual, once again, because who would have done such a thing? 
there simply were no people who went to this place, and especially this near the Goldammer barn and corral. So it had to have been done by the Sasquatches. But I wondered why they went through the trouble to pull all these ferns up and not take them, unless they had taken most of them and forgotten this bundle. I also wondered what use they had for them. The Sasquatches in Yakult that year seemed to have little or no fear of people, and other people began encountering them as time went on. I began receiving reports of people seeing the creatures near the Lewis River on the southern end of the Yakult Valley, in the middle of the day, crossing the road. There were reports by children playing near the fire station just a quarter mile from the Goldammer home, and of people seeing them cross the pastures in the evenings just before dark. There were a lot of rumors, and people were afraid to be out after dark. The creatures seemed to be in numerous locations all over the small Yakult Valley. All we could do was reassure people we talked to who had seen something and were afraid that the creatures had not harmed anyone or any animals as far as we knew, and that they were just curious. Most of the time this worked, but I wondered how long before something happened and someone would be injured and the Sasquatches would get the blame. I began getting a number of new people join the PCSIT by September, and many of the younger members were excited to go with me to Yakult. I needed more people to help us cover the growing area of activity and welcomed the new people's help. The Yakult Fire Station is located on the southern edge of town and is on the same road as the Goldammer home. There was then a stand of older fir trees directly across the road from the fire station, and a number of people had told us that they either saw the creatures themselves near this stand of trees or heard strange sounds from the depths of the small wood. I decided to take my new field crew one evening there to have a look around to determine if there was anything to these stories. It rained that day and evening, and was very wet when we arrived. I thought the rain might not be so bad if something recent was there, as footprints would be very good quality and wet ground. The group numbered six or seven of us, and everyone carried a flashlight and camera and was dressed for the wet conditions. We parked our cars along the road across from the fire station, and with me in the lead, entered the wood. There was a good trail through the trees, as I had been told many of the local children played in these woods, and it made our journey much easier. The stand of trees covered a larger area than appeared from the road, and it took us about 30 minutes to reach the far side. Once we reached the far edge of the timber, I saw that we were in the fields adjacent to the Goldammer property and thought that this may indeed be a good place to search. We had seen no signs of the creatures on our way in the stand of trees, but halfway back, they were there. The rain was coming down much harder than when we began looking around there, and tree limbs were thick in many places, making vision not very good. We walked slowly, looking as best we could in the present conditions, when one member of my team stopped and asked if anyone heard that noise. Everyone stopped and we listened, but heard nothing but the heavy rainfall on the trees. Just as we began walking, he said he heard it again, and I asked what he had heard. He said he heard breaking tree limbs. For a moment, I thought he had simply heard the echoes of our own feet breaking small limbs as we walked along. But before we started walking again, we all heard a very loud tree limb crack, then break. Everyone jumped, startled, and then we heard more as something big moved through the thick tree limbs and foliage near where we were standing. Several of us shone our flashlights in the direction of the noise and were met with the eye shine of something big. As when Nick Jr. and I had tried to see more, conditions were not always very good for vision with a flashlight at night. And now, with heavy rain included, vision was not good. The eyes watching us looked the same in color as the ones Nick and I had seen, this time no more than 30 feet from us. The eyes were about 7 feet or so above the ground, and when we shined out lights in its direction, it just stayed in that spot. I knew that my new people were scared, so I had to remain calm and get them out of there. I could not for certain tell them that this was one of the Sasquatches I had told them about, but once again I cannot imagine what else it could have been. Whatever was there watching us was curious for the moment, and I did not know how my new group would react if it moved toward us. I just wanted to get my crew out of there, and we would talk about it later. I told them all to remain calm, and led the way out. I kept my light shined in the direction of the eyes, which blinked, and seemed to watch us leave. Whatever was there did not follow us out, and soon we exited the woods and drove away. 
My new crew members were pretty shook up by the experience, and I told them that this was the sort of experiences they could expect here, but were actually very rare. Yakult, I told them, was one of the exceptions that I had experienced in my 19 years at that time involved in looking for Sasquatches, and we may never again experience this kind of activity in one location. No one lost enthusiasm for going back to search more, and when I told the new members the following week I was returning to Yakult, everyone was anxious to go back. Since the wooded area seemed to be a prime location to look at, and with the recent experience, I hoped the rain had not destroyed all of any footprints that may have been made there. I wanted to teach my new people how to properly identify tracks, make measurements, photograph, and cast tracks. When we arrived in Yakult, we first went to the Goldammer home to see if anything new had been seen or heard. I always made my first stop at the Goldammers. Since they had been so generous, I felt obligated, plus I liked them and have become friends with the family. I made the introductions of my new members of the PCSIT, and I decided to divide the team so we could cover more ground. Don and Carol and some of the newest members stayed at the Gold Dammers, and were going to search the lower fields and nearby woods. I would be taking the rest of the team down the road across from the fire station to see if any evidence survived the rainstorm. The downpour had lasted several days, and there were nothing but large puddles full of water all over. And as I thought, nothing remained of any markings that may have been left on the ground. I wanted also to look at the tree limbs that had been broken by whatever had been near us, but now we were not sure in the daylight exactly where we saw the eyes. We looked anyway, as I told the new people it was good practice for them regardless if we found anything or not. They needed the experience. We did find a little hair on some tree limbs, but never determined what it came from. One of our new members, Dustin Ellis, was unable to go to the Goldammer home with the rest of the team, but said he would make it as soon as he could. While I had my team searching the woods across from the occult fire station, Dustin drove to the Goldammer home. He was almost at their house when he saw a head on the side of the road, what he thought to be someone standing in a pasture near the road. He said he slowed down in case this person stepped out into the road in front of him. As he approached the person, he discovered it was no human, but a large, hair-covered creature. He sped up to put some distance between himself and the creature, and soon drove into the Gold Dammer driveway. Don Turner was there when he stopped, and told Don about what he had just seen. Don told him to stay with his group until I returned with the rest of the group and decided what we should do. My team spent about two hours near the fire station, and when I thought we had finished all we could accomplish there, decided to reunite with the rest of the group at the Goldammer's home. No sooner than we drove in the driveway of the Goldammer home, Don came right over and told me what Dustin had seen. I gathered everyone around and said we would search the forest where Dusty had seen the creature. I had everyone spread out about 20 feet apart, and we stayed in a line to sweep the area where he last saw the creature. The Sasquatch itself was long gone, but we did find a line of footprints where it went up the hill. The soil was very loose on the hill, and the footprints were sunk in deeply. As each foot lifted out of the loose soil, much debris fell back into the imprint, leaving the outline, but details were almost non-existent. It was too bad with such a fresh track line, but I showed everyone how to properly document them anyway, and said that we could never predict what we would find, and had to make do with any evidence we found. We tried following the line of tracks up the slope of Yakult Mountain, and were able to for a long distance, but reached a place where a large quantity of Oregon grape plants covered the entire area and lost the trail. We even tried to go around this seemingly endless patch of bushes, but with no luck, and finally returned to the Gold Dammer home. I explained to everyone that no matter what condition the footprints were in, they must follow as far in both directions in a line of prints. This was done to make certain that the tracks had not been hoaxed, if the tracks stopped in places where they would have been made if a living creature had walked there, then the tracks were very likely the product of a hoax. Likewise, if the condition were not very good in one area, they might be made in very favorable soil later on somewhere in the line. There was also a possibility the creature itself might be found by following a line of tracks. One never knew what could be found, so I told them that this was something I always wanted them to do. As winter came on, the reports of Sasquatches being seen in the occult valley seemed to narrow to nearly nothing. As had happened with the PCSIT, new people joined, stayed for a while, then moved on, 
and new people joined. We seemed to have periodic turnovers of members. The remaining board members stayed constant, though, and we would eventually add one more member to the board, but this was not for another year. I kept going to the Goldammer home through the fall and winter, but not as often as during the summer, as little had been seen or heard. I thought the creatures might be wintering elsewhere in the region or following traditional food somewhere else. I kept going, though, until I was certain that they would no longer return. When the weather began returning warm the spring of 1990, I received a report from a man cutting firewood on the opposite side of the valley from the Goldammer farm. This man said he was cutting firewood one Saturday when he heard a noise while he was taking a break from his work. He looked at some fallen trees and saw this creature standing less than a hundred feet from him, watching him. He said he had a rifle with him, but did not feel threatened, and left it where it was. He looked back at the visitor for a couple minutes, then it left heading away from the valley. I told Ron Madler about the sighting, and he asked if I thought they were coming back. I said, I didn't know, but had better go visit the Goldammers and tell them about this report, since it was on the southern side of the valley and only a couple miles from where they lived. Don and Carol had also made periodic trips to visit with the Goldammers, and when I told them I was going there, they wanted to go along too. I told Brenda and Nick Jr. about the recent sighting, but they said they had seen nothing since the previous fall, but would keep their eyes open and call me if anything came around. I had been talking to Rene de Hinden since the events in the occult began, and he told me by that April he was coming there. I had hoped he would come when activity was at its height, but Rene had a lot more experience than I did, and maybe he would turn up more than we had. He arrived at the Goldammer home in late April and talked with Nick Jr. and Brenda about what they had seen, and we all discussed all the subsequent events that took place and the things we saw and found. Rene said he would spend a week or so in the area and see what he turned up. I was working a lot of hours then and came to Yakult as often as I was able, but Rene turned up a number of stories, but nothing much had happened since the previous fall. Before he went home, Rene told me now he wished he had come here when I first called him. I wish he had too. The Sasquatches had apparently seen enough of the occult valley, and there were no more reports like the summer and fall of 1989. I began searches in other parts of the region, and Don and Carol continued to visit the Goldammers periodically to check in to see if anything new had happened. There were sporadic sighting reports early in the spring of 1990, but seemed to have stopped by April of that year. No more reports came from there, and eventually Ron Madler even moved to Yakult because of the events that happened that summer. Yakult is one of the rare cases in the entire history of the Sasquatch, and is up there with the events that occurred in the area of Bluff Creek, California, from 1957 to 1967. The main difference between Yakult and Bluff Creek was that Bluff Creek was widely known and received a lot of publicity, while Yakult was kept quiet. The level and kinds of things that happened at Yakult may very well exceed those at Bluff Creek, and had we been able to obtain film footage of one or more of the Sasquatches that frequently had been seen that summer, Yakult might have become the name synonymous with the Sasquatch, more so than Bluff Creek has. This concludes the reading for Haunted Valley. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open now.